All right. Hello, everybody. Chelsea here, and welcome to whatever number episode of the Love Over Fear show this is. I feel like we've done a lot of episodes now, and for those of you who are just finding out about the Love Over Fear show, this is a series that we do twice a month in our free community, Moving Beyond Fear. Um, we have been doing this show, I think, since November of 2020, which, let's see how many months, it's like nine months times two episodes. We have like probably 18, give or take, episodes that Sarah and I intentionally choose to give you hope and education and empowerment in your journey of overcoming relationship anxiety or anxiety in general. Um, what we've done is we, we hear what the community is saying, we hear what our clients are saying, we feel into what we have experienced, and we choose episodes and topics based on the common themes or the frequently asked questions or the things that we are most working on with our clients. So these themes are so intentionally chosen to really help you understand how fear and anxiety, specifically relationship anxiety, manifests and how you can begin to truly choose love over fear. Um, it's, I can't remember who says this, I'm blanking, but it has been said that every emotion or experience or behavior can be boiled down to love or fear. And relationship anxiety causes us to show up in our relationships and in our lives from a place of fear. And we want to help you show up in your world, show up for yourself, show up from your, for your partner, for your friends, from a place of love. So we absolutely love putting on this show for you. Um, we put a lot of time into planning it. These episodes are so juicy and action packed. They're anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour. So eventually we are going to convert this into a podcast <laughs> that is on my list of things to do this year. Um, so if you are with me live, say hello. Let's have a little bit of human interaction in this digital space. Let me know that you are with me, that you are watching, and let me know if you're with me live what you're most excited to learn today. Uh, I don't remember if I've already said today's topic, but today's topic is dealing with differences in relationships. This is probably one of the most frequently dealt with things um, with our clients, uh, relationship anxiety loves to latch on to the differences that we have between us and our partners. So I've never really <laughs> gone a very long time without talking about this topic with our clients because it is so prevalent in the relationship anxiety community. And so I've put together a nice juicy episode for you uh, hello, I've been waiting for this. Excited to learn about how to deal with the anxiety around this topic. Beautiful. I'm excited too. This topic is so near and dear to my heart because this is one of the biggest things that my relationship anxiety latched onto in my relationship. Hello, I'm excited to learn about how to moderate my own emotions when I feel frustrated or worried about the future based on differences with my partner. Beautiful, right? The anxious mind loves to run ahead uh, take these differences that we have and, and run ahead into the future and say, oh my gosh, this is going to happen. It's going to be catastrophic since we have these differences. And that's pretty much what my relationship anxiety did. So I just want to give a little bit of uh, background about what this looked like for me and how this showed up for me. Um, if you're not sure yourself of, of if maybe your relationship anxiety is latching on to your differences with your partner. Okay, so I know I, I <clears throat> talk about my story a lot, but I also know a lot of new people are coming into this community and, and maybe don't know this part of my story. But I came from a very um, fundamentalist Christian household, Christian upbringing. Um, I was taught very explicitly that 
you cannot, cannot date someone who doesn't have the same religious and spiritual, and usually that meant political. Our church was also very, um, uh, had a very political stance. A lot of churches tend to do that in, in the West as well, or in America. Um, I was told very explicitly that I couldn't date someone of a different religion or had different spiritual beliefs, and even someone that wasn't as committed to the faith as me. Maybe they were a Christian, but if they weren't as committed and had the exact same uh, relationship with God that I did, I could not date this person. And if I did, it meant that I wasn't really um, a true believer. It meant that I didn't really care about my faith. Um, so I got these very explicit messages. And it also meant that I was going to be pulled away from the faith if I dated someone of a different religion, of a different spiritual belief, or someone who wasn't as committed to the faith as me. So that's, you know, my background. And my husband was raised Catholic. And he, I, I was so committed to the faith. I helped start churches. I went to Bible college. Like I was all in. And for him, Christianity or Catholicism never, it never really sat with him in the same way that it did with me. And my parents were both, they met, you know, through the church and his parents, his dad was kind of agnostic and his mom was very, a very devoted Catholic. So he got to see how two people with different spiritual beliefs could have a wonderful, healthy marriage. Um, and I was taught from a very young age that that wasn't possible. And not only was it not possible, but it was actually very frowned upon from the church community and frowned upon by God. So when I met my husband, my now husband, Matt, um, you know, from the get go, we were very upfront. Um, he was like, yeah, it doesn't, you know, the faith doesn't really mean much for me. And it meant a lot for me, but yeah, <laughs> yet I couldn't, um, I, I kind of said in my mind on our first date, yep, no, nope, this isn't going to work. This couldn't possibly work. Yeah, this is nice, but no. Um, yet I couldn't help the connection I felt with Matt, my now husband. And it went against everything I had ever been taught um, that people who aren't of the same faith are amoral and are going to like, you're not going to have this great relationship. And yet I felt so safe and so seen and so desired and so supported in this relationship I was building. And it was, it caused so much anxiety because it went against everything I was taught. Um, here I was doing the very thing that I was taught was so wrong to be with someone of a different faith. And not only did we have differences in faith and in spiritual beliefs, our personalities and our interests were incredibly different. We used to joke all the time and say, um, you know, we, we would have never matched on a dating app because on paper or on, you know, when you write out who you are and, and what you like, we would have just wiped away. We met in person. Um, but you know, on paper, we just seem so incompatible. I am a very deep thinker. I'm very, um, into spirituality and self self-development. Um, I'm very like existential. My brain is never, it never shuts up. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm very deep, very empathic. And my husband is very logical. Um, his mind doesn't go to the places that my mind does. He like, he's not really interested in having these crazy existential conversations. And so I pretty much thought that these differences were a deal breaker. Um, cause I'm like, well, I'm so deep and I'm so, oh my gosh, I'm so like amazing and spiritual and, and he's not. And, 
you know, like, that's just never going to work. Maybe I should be with someone who's really deep like me. And I was uh, in my master's program to become a therapist at the time. And so I'm like, maybe I should be with like another therapist. And, <laughs> and uh, I had pretty much written off, like, this just isn't going to work. This just isn't going to work. My anxiety was convinced. My fear was convinced that if we had differences, it just couldn't work. It was going to end in catastrophe. I was going to feel so unfulfilled down the road. Anyone else out there have these types of fears active right now in your relationship? Let me know. Do you fear, oh my gosh, it's just not going to work. It's going to end up horribly. You know, we're not supposed to have these kinds of differences. Um, maybe we're not compatible enough. Maybe I should find someone who thinks like me, who likes all the things that I like, who has the same kind of spiritual beliefs as me. Because this, I've heard this many a time, many a time, my friends. I know I'm not alone in this. So here's the thing. My anxiety was focused on these surface level things, on the things that I was always told were deal breakers. I was told from the religious culture. I was told from family um, that these are the shoulds. These are the rules you need to follow that compatibility. And even in our culture, we hear compatibility, compatibility, compatibility. Um, Yes, based on my parents, he has traits of my dad and I have traits of my mom. I expect us to end up like them. Oh, yeah. Especially if, our, if we've witnessed our parents have a train wreck marriage. So we, we keep hearing in, in our society, compatibility, compatibility, compatibility. But what does compatibility even mean according to society? When you hear the word compatibility, what, what's the definition that comes to your mind? Oh, are you compatible? Are you compatible? Take this compatibility test. Swipe. I don't even know the directions. I've never been on a dating app. <laughs> Swipe this way if you're compatible. Um, what, what does compatibility even mean according to our culture, according to the cultural narrative? So sit with that one for a second. What, what are we being told compatibility means? What is the internalized definition that you have? Mm. And when I've asked this question, what I hear a lot and what I even asked myself was what I hear a lot is you're similar. That compatibility means you think the same way, you like similar things, like, you know, everything is just like, oh yeah, we jive on everything. Compatibility means similar or same or having lots of similarities. So we're given messages from our family, from maybe if we have a religion we were brought up in, from our society, that differences are bad. <laughs> <laughs> that differences end in misery. As someone just shared, um, her parents were very different and they ended up hating each other. Um, someone said the compatibility means we'll be happy forever and never have issues because we're on the same page, right? We're on the same page about everything all the time. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So we're, so we're told from so many different places, whether it's experiences, seeing our parents who are different, ended up hating each other. We're told explicitly that differences are going to like be the downfall of your relationship. We're told from dating sites and movies that compatibility means you're similar. So no wonder why we get so anxious and have so much fear when you and your partner have differences or have certain traits and we're told that differences equal catastrophe so the anxious brain is going to latch onto that and say if we're different i'm going to get hurt 
if we're different, I'm doing something wrong. That was a big thing for me. I'm doing something wrong. I'm bad. And if I'm doing something wrong, I'm, there's just no way I could have a thriving, successful relationship. So my anxiety latched onto that and made that meaning, that fear-based meaning about the differences. So I, have a, I want to leave you with a question here. What are the stories that you have been told explicitly or implicitly about differences or even about certain traits, certain personality traits, certain interests? What traits or beliefs or, or things were you told weren't acceptable? What were the stories you were told, whether explicitly or implicitly, about differences or certain traits? And what traits were you told weren't acceptable? Or what traits were lifted up as superior? <laughs> Sit with that. Inquire about that. Because I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give a little spoiler alert to something I'm going to go into. It's really not about the differences. It's about the stories you were told about differences. It's not about the differences. It's about the stories you were told about differences. For we are made to feel afraid of those who think and believe and act differently from us. So what are, what are some of the traits you were told weren't acceptable or what traits were more elevated? And for me, the traits that were seen as superior was being this deep thinker and this like overly like empathic, compassionate soul. Like I just thought that like I was so superior because this is the way I viewed the world. That because I was spiritual, that I was like, oh my gosh, I was just like so amazing because I was so spiritual and such a deep thinker. So those traits were elevated and therefore I looked down on my partner because he didn't have those traits, because he was logical, because he wasn't this bleeding heart like me. And the thing is, is what you reject in yourself you reject in your partner. I'm going to say that again. What you reject in yourself, you reject in your partner. So if I was taught that like being spiritual and a deep thinker is superior, that means I've rejected simplicity. I've rejected taking things as they are in life. That that was inferior. So I rejected that in Matt. I rejected that in my partner. The things I rejected in myself, I rejected in my partner. Another big one that I see a lot is laziness. Laziness. When your partner, my partner is so good at relaxing. He's so good at doing nothing. And what are we usually taught about that? Oh. <gasps> Productivity, 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 productivity equals worth. So maybe when you have a partner who d doesn't always want to go, 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 produce, 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 do, 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 do. Maybe they do just want to play video games. Maybe they do just want to watch a show on the couch. Maybe they do just want to take it easy. And we have rejected that. A lot of us have rejected, especially if you're an anxious type, you're probably the type that always has to do something. I'm talking to myself here. You're always the type that has to be productive. You're terrified of slowing the fuck down. And you, you, you base your worthiness on your doingness. And if you have a partner who is not like that, guess what? If you've rejected the ability to rest, if you've rejected lack of productivity within yourself, you're going to reject it in your partner. And guess what? You're going to say, oh, my partner's just so lazy and I just don't know what to do. They're just so lit. They don't like to, they're not, blah, 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 blah. right? You've rejected rest and lack of productivity in yourself, so you reject it in your partner. And I want to read a quote from my, the amazing spiritual teacher and author Eckhart Tolle. He says, anything that you resent and strongly react to in another 
is also in you. So if you're getting anxious and fearful and nitpicky about something your partner does or doesn't do or thinks, if you're getting so reactive, fearful, anxious, look inward, inquire, is there anything that they are doing that I've actually rejected in myself that I have been taught to see as less than? I've also seen this uh, around um, the ability to be really social. If your partner is not an extrovert, <laughs> I am kind of in between introvert and extrovert and my partner is like, he's like full introvert. <laughs> if we have um, rejected lack of socialness in ourselves, we're going to reject that in our partner. If we have elevated extrovertism as being superior to being introverted, we're going to reject our partner's lack of desire for social parties. We're going to reject that in our partner. So if you are reacting strongly, maybe your partner isn't the funniest at the party or isn't the smoothest talker or the deepest thinker or the most spiritual when you're around your friends. If you have a strong reaction of anxiety and fear to that, that means there's something you're probably rejecting in yourself. Chelsea, damn it. You didn't tell me you're going to be calling me out this much in this episode. Jeez. I thought this episode was going to be about my partner. No, honey. It's always about us. It always comes back to us and how we relate to ourselves and how we were taught to relate to others. So why do we get so anxious about differences? Why do we have so much fear around them? One, it's about the stories we were told about differences, the stories we were told about certain traits. Two, what you reject in yourself, you reject in your partner. If you have a strong reaction to something your partner thinks, says, does, embodies, maybe it's time to inquire and see what, what have I rejected in myself that I'm now resenting in my partner. All right. Let's marinate. This is going to be a long episode, y'all. <laughs> it's going to be a long episode. Some people are going to hate me out there. Woo! All right. I know there's people with me. All right. Are we still breathing? Are we still okay? Are we hashtag triggered? Let's <sighs> take a breath. Let's take a breath. And if you're commenting, maybe I'm just not seeing the comments coming. Okay. The third reason why we get so anxious and fearful when our partner is different from us in some way is that we have learned that our beliefs, our interests, our even our personality is our identity. We have learned that our beliefs, our interests, and even our personality is our identity. It's the whole of who we are. When I was a really intense Christian, that was, the, that was my identity, the whole of who I am. And what this is, it's an ego tactic. The ego gets its identity and value from what we believe, what you do, how you look, etc. It the ego thrives on these surface level things. It's my identity, and if anyone questions or has differences from my identity, then my identity is threatened. So maybe you have a, a particular belief about something and your partner isn't quite on the same page. If you feel fear and the need to change your partner, that's the ego. That's the ego trying to maintain its identity and it feels that its identity is being threatened because someone does not agree with you. I feel like the internet right now. I mean, <laughs> we're seeing this so much that we, we, the ego derives its identity from what you believe, what you do, and how you look, and things like that. And the thing is, 
as those beliefs I had in the beginning of my relationship, those spiritual beliefs, I don't have the same spiritual beliefs anymore. Did I, did I die? Did I lose my identity? No, there was something deeper underneath those beliefs. That is my true identity. But the ego gets its identity and its sense of self from these things and says, I am this belief. I am this activity that I like to do. I am this physical trait or my partner is their physical trait. My partner is this belief. And it believes like that this is set in stone. That these things are, you're, this is set in stone. If you believe this, this is who you are and it's never gonna change. And, and the thing is about the ego is it loves to think that it's superior. <laughs> it says things like the way I think is the right way. The fact that I was so deep and spiritual and existential and just like so empathic. Like that's the right way to be. And anyone who isn't like me is inferior. The things I like are superior. <laughs> the way I look, the way I dress is superior. And we can we can look at that part of us with love because we all have that part of us. We can actually, I love to use humor with that part of myself when I look back and see how much my ego is identified with my beliefs, with my personality. Yeah, my personality, I am a deep thinker. I'm very empathic. I'm very like woo woo. But my ego made an identity out of that and said that anyone who is different from that or thought differently or perceived the world differently was inferior. And that anxiety will latch onto that and will say, you've got to change. If you don't think like me, if you don't like the things I like, if you're different from me, you've got to change. Because the way I do things is the right way. And that's why you've got to change. Chelsea, God damn it! stop it. Stop it. Stop making me think about myself. You're supposed to change my partner. Come on, Chelsea. I don't like this episode. Okay, sorry. I'm just like, this is just what, this is how it is. This is how it was for me, okay? If you don't like it, fine. Whew. Okay, we're ready for the last reason why we get so anxious about differences. Okay, it's because we have a lack of control. Your partner being their own person, having their own beliefs, having different ways of going about the world and having differences, it's out of your control. You cannot control another human being. You cannot change someone's beliefs. You cannot change the way someone does something, which means it's out of your control. And if we know anything about anxiety is that it craves control. When it has uncertainty and it feels out of control, it's gonna go on overdrive. So it's gonna start nitpicking. <laughs> it's gonna start demanding that your partner think and do things the way you do. It's going to start judging. It's going to start criticizing. It's going to start trying to convince. I did that so much in the beginning of my relationship, trying to convince Matt to come to my spiritual beliefs. Because remember, mine were the right way. Mine were the superior beliefs. The way he, his spiritual beliefs and, and the way he thought, that was inferior. So. The fact that he didn't think the way I did and he had his own beliefs was out of my control. And anxiety was like, oh, hell no. So I've got to convince you to do things the way I do them and to think the way that I think. So we get so anxious about our partner's differences because it's out of our control. They are their own human being. And anxiety is like, no but I need to be able to control you and I need you to do the things that I like to do and I need you to think the way I like to think because if, if you don't, then I'm going to get triggered. And, ah! oh, Chelsea, stop it. Stop it, Chelsea. You're making me think too much. 
So it makes so much sense that we get anxious about differences. There's all these factors at play. We've been told stories about differences. We have certain narratives around differences. That differences mean you, you just can't be in relationship with someone. We were told stories about certain traits. What's inferior, what's superior. We reject certain things in ourselves, so we reject those things in our partner. Number three, we have identified with our beliefs, with the, our hobbies, how we look. And so if our partner doesn't, you know, embodies the things that we reject in ourselves, then we're going to reject them and feel anxious and feel fearful and critical. And then finally, the fact that your partner has differences means they're their own person and that's out of your control. <laughs> and anxiety wants control. Anxiety wants control. But we can't control another human being and how they think and what they do. So anxiety is going to criticize, judge, nitpick, convince, manipulate in order to get someone to be more in your control. Whew, Chelsea, I don't like this episode. I do not like this episode. So now, how can we shift our perspective? If you're still, with, I feel like I've scared some people off for real. Um, so if you're still listening, <laughs> let me know you're still with me. Okay, so here, that's why we get anxious. That's why we get critical. That's why we get fearful. That's why we nitpick. That's why we look, is the grass greener somewhere else? That, but, and the reality is, is we are never, ever, 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 ever going to find someone on this planet who has the exact same viewpoints at all times and the exact same hobbies and the exact same everything. Because by nature, we're two different people who've come from two different backgrounds, had different experiences, different personalities that then perceive the world differently. So by nature, no two human beings are exactly identical. We're not going to find a carbon copy of ourselves. So we're going to have to learn to get comfortable with differences. Okay. Okay. So, how can we shift our perspective around differences? How can we start to get comfortable with differences instead of seeking control and, and fearing what will happen if we have differences with our partner? So we need to ask ourselves, are differences actually the problem? Are the differences in interests, the differences in how we see things, the differences in attractiveness? Yes, I went there. The differences in style, the differences in tastes. Is that actually the problem? Time for me to sip some tea while you think about that. I'm gonna give you, I'm just gonna give you an answer here. It's not the differences that are the problem, it's the belief about one's own beliefs. It's not about the beliefs, it's the belief about your beliefs. So remember when I said, if you believe that your beliefs are superior and anyone who thinks and does and feels differently than you is inferior, that's where the differences become the problem. It's not the differences, it's your beliefs about your differences. It's the beliefs about your own beliefs and preferences. If you believe that the way you think and the way you do things and the way you act is the way, is the right way, you're going to then treat anyone who has differences in a, in a certain way that maybe isn't in alignment with what you truly desire. So if you believe, no, the way I see things is the right way, it's gonna cause fights and conflict, um, judgments, criticism. It's no longer gonna feel safe to express, your partner's no longer gonna feel safe to express themselves in the relationship because they're, so, they, they're so afraid that if they say the wrong thing or if they don't agree with you, that they're gonna get chewed up. <laughs> and for the person who said, you know, they witnessed their parents who were so different end up hating each other, I imagine that this was actually the problem. It wasn't the differences, it was their beliefs about their own beliefs and preferences. And therefore how they treated one another 
when it came to differences. So it's not the differences is the problem. It's what we believe about our own beliefs and our own preferences and therefore how we treat the other person who does not have the same beliefs or who does not have the same preferences. So if the differences in themselves aren't the problem, but it's the way we believe what we believe about the differences and therefore how we treat others who are different, then let's shift the focus from needing to be similar to being better at navigating differences. Let's shift the focus from needing to be similar to being better at navigating differences. Because like I said before, you are bound to come up against differences in your relationship. Differences in the way you do things, even different differences in preference of cleanliness of the house, you know, like differences in how you load the dishwasher, <laughs> like d just from small differences to big differences, like me and my husband's spiritual beliefs. I, I no longer believe what I used to believe, but I'm still a very spiritual person. And I see the world through this very woo woo lens. And he's like, what? What? That makes no sense. What are you talking about? So we see the world very differently. And yet we coexist, not only just like, okay, we can get along. We have a beautiful, delicious, thriving relationship. Um, someone said, yes, my boyfriend said sometimes when he's doing something he loves, usually gaming, he gets worried. I'm going to snap at him and have an issue with him doing what he loves. Right. So that's a, a beautiful, a thousand percent the dishwasher. <laughs> that's a beautiful opportunity to look inward and, and ask ourselves, what do I believe about my own beliefs and preferences? And what do I believe about others who don't have the same preferences or ways of doing things or ways of thinking? So instead of shifting the focus from needing your partner to like all the same things you do, to load the dishwasher the same way you do, to even have the same spiritual beliefs. Yes, I'm saying something a bit controversial. And of course, there's always nuance to this. There's always nuance to this. But I truly believe it's not the differences that are the problems. It's the beliefs about your differences and therefore how you treat another person based on these beliefs about your beliefs. So Let's move away from needing to be similar and being better at navigating differences. So can you be more understanding? Can you see the common ground even in the differences? Can you be a bit more open? Can you be a bit more accepting? Can you see the human, the human beneath the preferences, the beliefs, even the appearance? Can you see and relate to the human being underneath all of this surface stuff? Because guess what? Our beliefs can change. The things we like to do can change. Our personality can even change. I am very different. I mean, I have a lot of similarities because like I'm still quirky and weird and whatnot. But I mean, I'm so different from when Matt first met me. The things I believe. Um, what I believe about myself, even the things I like to do. I, I became a pole dancer after Matt married me. Okay. And, <laughs> and uh, he's not a big fan of it. But um, again, we can navigate those differences with grace. Um, so the things we like to do, our beliefs, these things can change. Even from seven, five, oh, gosh, what year is it? Even from seven years ago, my political beliefs are different. My spiritual beliefs are different. How I view so many things are different. So these are really, these are things that can change. But the thing that will never change is that your partner is a human being. So can you be, can you begin to relate to the human being, the soul underneath all the surface stuff? That's going to make it a lot easier to navigate differences. Can you be more understanding? Can you see the human? Can you be more open? Can you be more accepting? This is really what we all need to work on. <laughs> this is really what helps any relationship thrive. It's understanding, openness, acceptance, seeing the humanity in another person regardless of 
their differences and knowing that they are deserving of respect. Even if you're like, I really don't agree. I, babe, I love you. I don't agree. And me, me and Matt have things like that of like, when it comes to like pole dancing and, and like female sexuality and expression and uh, things like that, we, we have some disagreements, fundamental disagreements about that. But guess what? I know he's a human being. He has different ways of viewing the world. So I try to be understanding of maybe where he's coming from, even though I'm like, I so disagree. <gasps> he's a human being. Underneath all that, underneath our disagreements, our different ways of seeing things, underneath all that, he's a soul. He's a facet of consciousness, expressing itself as the human that is Matt Horton. <laughs> so can we dive beneath the surface and relate to the human? That every human, we just want to be loved and seen and heard and respected. I want to read a quote from Alain de Baton. He is a British philosopher and a cynic around romanticism. Uh, please go to YouTube and watch his stuff about love. It is amazing. Um, so I want to read a quote from him. He says, okay, I want you to listen to this because it's good stuff. I remember stumbling upon his work when I was going through relationship anxiety and it just was so helpful in shifting my perspective around differences. Okay. Okay. This is such a good quote. I, just, I want you to be prepared. All right. You ready for the quote? Cause it's so good. And it goes against what our culture says. The person who is best suited to us is not the person who shares our every taste such person does not exist, but the person who can negotiate differences in taste intelligently, the person who is good at disagreement, rather than some notional idea of perfect, perfect complementarity, it is the capacity to tolerate differences with generosity that is the true marker of the not overly wrong person because he believes everyone marries the wrong person. There's no such thing as a right person. <laughs> Everyone's a little wrong for us. So it's the capacity to tolerate differences with generosity that is the true marker of the not overly wrong person. Compatibility is an achievement of love. It must not be its precondition. I'm going to read that again because I think that quote is bomb. The person who is best suited to us is not the person who shares our every taste. Such person does not exist. But the person who can negotiate differences in taste intelligently. The person who is good at disagreement. Rather than some notional idea of perfect complementarity, it is the capacity to tolerate differences with generosity that is the true marker of the not overly wrong person. Compatibility is an achievement of love. It must not be its precondition. Oh, let's just marinate. Let's just marinate with that. Oh man. Compatibility is an achievement of love. It must not be its precondition. Oh, tolerating differences, being good at disagreement, not attacking each other's character because we're different, not criticizing and judging each other because we're different, but negotiating differences with grace and understanding. Is it still messy? Is it still gonna cause some arguments? Yeah. But again, it's not about the differences. It's about the beliefs about one's own, one's own beliefs and preferences, and therefore how you treat the other person. So really it boils down to character, how we treat one another. 
despite our differences. And doesn't that speak to love even more when we can respect someone and appreciate them even though they're different? Otherwise, we're just loving a carbon copy of ourselves, and that's pretty easy. <laughs> if we're just loving a carbon copy of ourselves, we're not challenged in any way. So to be able to respect someone, treat them with dignity, even in the face of differences, that's an achievement of love. That is a huge marker of love. Chelsea, I really hate this episode. I wish I never watched it. So how can we see differences with gratitude? Going beyond just tolerating differences and shifting our perspective, but how can we actually see differences with gratitude and appreciation? Well, like I was saying before, differences allow you to stretch and grow. You're not just loving a carbon copy of yourself. You're not you know, when, when we have a relationship with someone who has differences, it's going to challenge us. It's going to help us see the world through a new lens. Right? Because we, we're always trying to just reinforce our own way of seeing things and thinking that the way we see things is the only way or the right way or the most superior way. And when we have someone who challenges that, it allows us to go, oh, maybe there's value here. Maybe there's value in seeing the world in a different way or doing things differently, or this is an activity or a food I would have never tried if I didn't, you know, if I wasn't in relationship with this person who had these different interests. I was totally like anti-sports when I first started dating Matt. Like I was just like, all sports are dumb, all sports are boring. And <laughs> He is so into hockey. He's Canadian. Uh, <laughs> he's so into hockey. And he took me to my first ever live hockey game. And I was like, okay, this is actually pretty fun. So he, he stretched, he stretched my comfort zone. He introduced me to new things. He introduced me to new foods, a new way of seeing the world and really helped to help me to grow and to challenge my ideas that the way I see things and do things is the best way. So again, it helps you see value in many perspectives, not just your own. Being with someone who has differences helps you to see the world through a more multifaceted lens. And isn't that such a beautiful thing? And that's gonna ripple out into how you see the world and being able to like see differences with, with so much more beauty and appreciation. What a beautiful thing that we're all different, that we're not all just the same, that we have different interests and, and the way different things that spark us and ignite us and light us up. And we, it's like all these different pieces working together. We're all different facets of consciousness. I think I heard a quote once uh, when I was in relationship anxiety and, and shifting my beliefs, but it was like, each person is a different facet of God. How beautiful is that? That we're all different facets of consciousness or God. We're all different expressions. We're all our own unique color that make up this beautiful prism, this multifaceted prism so being able to appreciate and, and accept someone's differences helps you to see, wow, wow, what a beautiful thing that we all show up uniquely, that we're all a unique facet of God, of consciousness. Yeah. And we can also have gratitude for our partner's differences by not just seeing the cons of the differences, but seeing the pros, because guess what? The things you love about yourself have a shadow side. The fact that I'm like a deep thinker and I'm like so spiritual and so empathic, the thing that I wanted Matt to be, that has a shadow side. 
that means I'm anxious and neurotic and I take on people's energy and I can have poor boundaries. I could go on with my shadow side of being deep and spiritual and like so empathic and that's the superior way. But all these things that you love about yourself have a shadow side. And guess what? The traits you don't love about your partner have a positive side. You know, I used to just only see Matt's logicalness um, as just like a flaw. But that has been helpful in so many situations where my brain was like, when my shadow side of my depth came out and his logicalness brought grounding and clarity and simplicity. Because he's not this deep existential thinker, he is able to actually just enjoy life as it is. The shadow side of my death is that like, there's always a problem. (laughs) There's always a problem. So the positive side of the thing that you don't like about your partner, what is that? What are the positive aspects of the things that you don't necessarily love. And what are the shadow, again, bringing it back to you. Damn it, Chelsea, I don't wanna look at my shadow side. I'm awesome. Well, what, what's the shadow side of the things that you love about yourself and wish your partner was more like? It took me a while to come to this because I just thought I was awesome. Like I just thought, I mean, I am awesome, but also like, comes with a price. <laughs> comes with a price. So the things you love about yourself, what's the shadow side of that? And the traits you don't love about your partner, what's the positive side of that? What's the benefit of that? How does that help you in a lot of situations where you're stuck in seeing things in one way? That's a, good, that's a big question. What's the shadow side of the things that you love about yourself and wish your partner was more like? And what's the positive side of the traits you don't necessarily love about your partner? Okay. And finally, we can see differences with gratitude by seeing how differences create balance. It's like the yin and the yang. Differences create balance. When I am in my head and my husband is the stability. (laughs) He's the voice of reason. When we have been stuck inside and not socializing for months, uh, and Matt, since he's an introvert, he would never reach out to anyone. I'm the one who gets us engaging with friends. (laughs) So we create balance for one another. We are a team. Uh, Again, I don't know about sports a lot, but you don't want everyone to be a defenseman. You don't want everyone to be a goalie. Right, we, we need people who do different things and have different strengths because we're a team. That's what creates a team. So the differences create balance. So let's recap. We went over why we get anxious about relationships or about differences in our relationships, how we can begin to shift our perspective around these differences and how we can start seeing our partner's differences with gratitude and appreciation. I love this topic because this is something that I did so, I had so much come up for me and my relationship with differences and my relationship with myself. Um, Yeah, I'm able to, I love that, that Matt is exactly the way he is. I love that now. I used to want him to change. And what really needed to happen was I I needed to change. No, Chelsea, no, not again. I needed to change how I, what I believed about my beliefs and therefore how I treated other people due to my beliefs. Okay. And this, since I know that this is something that can run really deep, This is a whole core part of the work we do in our group program, The Luscious Love Immersion. I have a whole module dedicated to this that goes more in depth of navigating differences. And then, of course, we do the live work 
to help you dig deep and go in and see maybe where you've rejected yourself and therefore projecting that onto your partner, being able to have more openness, acceptance and love and appreciation. This is what we work on, a huge part of what we work on in our core group program, the Luscious Love Immersion. So if you want to be able to embody this sense of acceptance and understanding and appreciation around your partner's differences and you want support with that, please, please, please apply for this program. It is incredible. This program is the culmination of everything I've learned personally and professionally about not just relationship anxiety, but actually cultivating a really luscious, nourishing, beautiful relationship. So I am so damn proud of this program. Every time we get done with a session, a group session with our clients, we are just like lit up. I just feel like electricity within my body from doing this work. So if you want to take this beyond this episode and go deep and really work through the relationship anxiety, not just around the differences, but in other areas of your relationship and want to learn how to cultivate this solid foundation, this secure attachment in your relationship, then apply for this program. We take a limited number of people. We like to keep it small and intimate and connected. So I am going to post the link to the uh, page so you can read all the details. It's an eight week program. You can read all the details and you can apply for a free relationship anxiety assessment on the bottom of that page where we can meet face to face, go over this program, help you understand what's going on with you and how this program is really going to just whoosh, revolutionize how you're showing up in your relationship. So I will post the link to that. Thank you so much for being here. I hope this episode was illuminating and enriching. I gave a dose of tough love <laughs> to see right through the tactics of fear, right through the tactics of the ego, and how to truly begin to see our partners through this lens of love instead of fear and judgment and criticism. So if this episode helped you, if something really just like mic dropped, aha moment comment that moment let me know what stood out to you the most i really love to hear how um, these episodes are benefiting you all right everybody sending you so much love let's give ourselves a big hug for sitting through this hour-long episode i knew it was going to be an hour long <laughs> sending you so much love and until next time i can't wait to see you embrace love wholeheartedly